only appropriate to drink Red Bull from a tankard? Just saying. Hello everybody, it's Gemma here. It's a new week, and which means a new part of how Merlin should have come out. Last week, the theme was uh, Camelot, uh, with the red and the um, obviously yellow dragon on my eyes. And this week, the theme is Merlin. So I'm all stars and glitter, which I think is very fitting. So now to continue with the episode of Merlin where we left off. Just to remind you, Arthur has come across Merlin and Daniel doing something they probably shouldn't have been doing. Magic, that's right, and making out. As they've come downstairs, they've heard the shouts and screams of people running away as they have been attacked by the beetles which seem to be invading Camelot. So welcome to part two. It is the morning afterwards, and Arthur and a great congregation of people, the lords, ladies, kings and queens, are all in the great hall. They're all arguing and talking over each other, and Arthur calls out to them, Please, my lords, listen to Gaius. Gaius is in the centre of the room, and next to him is a table, and on the table is one of the dead beetles from last night. As I was saying, says Gaius, a species this big can only be a leviathan beetle, a type of magical creature that lives in caves to the east of here. But it is rare that they would come this far away from the forest or even attack people. Ranyar steps forward from the throng. The only people who were attacked were mine. Sneary comes forward too. And mine, she says. This is magic. She turns her gaze towards Ranyar. Employed any sorcerers under your wing recently, Ranyar? Ranyar instantly turns sharp. Careful, Sneary, he says. Unfounded suspicions might get you killed. Sneary immediately steps up to the plate. Is that a threat? She returns. Well, who knew Carrad was so desperate that they would attack their allies, even after the generous deals they've made with them? Says Ranyar. You dare, begins Sneary, and Arthur snaps. Enough. Everyone shuts up. He's actually finally started to behave like the king he is. Gaius, he says. Is this possible? Gaius considers for a moment. The directness of the attacks is suspicious, sire. Arthur thinks about what he said. My people go missing off the streets, now this. He mutters to himself. He now calls out to the throng. Any sorcerers in Camelot should know the penalty for magic. He looks directly at Daniel when he says this. Daniel stares right back. Merlin pipes up from the sidelines. Arthur, be quiet, Arthur interrupts. Merlin is shocked by his tone as seems to be Arthur. Arthur shakes himself for a moment before continuing. That penalty is death. Daniel finally speaks up. If this was done by magic, Daniel says, it would have to be dark magic, a type of magic very few possess. Arthur turns once again to Daniel. You sound very knowledgeable on the subject. Yes, well, magic and its teachings isn't outlawed everywhere, my lord, Daniel says. The two of them stare out before Arthur finally breaks eye contact. The talks will continue as planned. This time, he looks towards Ranyar and Sneary. Whoever did this will be held responsible, he says. You have my word. The meeting is over. We cut to outside the council chambers. People are leaving and muttering to themselves discontent. Merlin runs over to Daniel in the spare moment that he has. I'm so sorry, Daniel, says Merlin. This isn't fair. Daniel turns towards Merlin. Maybe it's a good idea we spend some time apart, Merlin, he says. I don't want your king to decide he wants to kill me. Daniel starts to pull away from Merlin's grasping hands. He wouldn't do that, Daniel, please. Daniel leaves, along with the other knights from Arter. Merlin is left alone in the corridor, tensing his hands and looking angry. We cut to Arthur's chambers. Arthur himself has obviously just walked in. He's pulling off his gloves, finger by finger with force. Merlin crashes through the door just behind him. He immediately strides over to Arthur. Does my word mean nothing to you? He begins. Arthur sighs, obviously prepared for this. He's a sorcerer, Merlin, he says. It's not you I don't trust, it's him. Is that it then? Says Merlin. Just because he is magic, he's the one responsible. That's wrong, Arthur, and you know it. Arthur finally turns around to face Merlin. These disappearances, he says, these deaths started as soon as he arrived. That doesn't mean he did it, says Merlin. Arthur enunciates each word. People who use magic are evil, Merlin. Is Gaius evil? Merlin retorts. Arthur shakes his head. No, you... I thought you were better than this, Arthur, Merlin says. I thought you weren't going to repeat your father's mistakes. He was your king, Merlin, Arthur says. You should show him some respect. 
Merlin does not care. He's on a different train of thought now. Do you know what I think it really is? Everything in my life is about you, Arthur. Everything. And the one time that it isn't. The one time you threaten to kill them. Arthur throws up his hands. He threw you on the roof. You know what we were doing on that roof. Arthur stops at Merlin's words, frozen for a second. They're on the verge of speaking all the things they've never actually spoken about. Are you jealous? Is that it? Says Merlin. Arthur immediately shuts himself away. Don't be stupid, he says. If you were, would you ever admit it? Says Merlin. Arthur is wrestling with unspoken words in his mouth. He swallows them back down. I don't care what you do, Merlin, he says. You're my servant. Just leave me be. He walks to a different part of his chamber, leaving Merlin alone. So be it, thinks Merlin. Merlin goes to the door and opens it. Before he shuts it, he calls out to the empty room. As you wish, sire. He shuts the door and leaves. Merlin storms into his and Gaius's chambers. Gaius is in there, trying to examine the beetle. He looks up at Merlin from his spectacles. Merlin, are you alright? I need some air, says Merlin, grabbing his jacket and leaving. Merlin! He calls out, but Merlin's gone. Merlin is riding out through the town, into the night. He's riding along the main street, past the pub where Gwen and Percival was, when he hears a sound. A shout from a dark alleyway. Even though he is visibly upset, Merlin stops his horse and waits for a moment. He dismounts, going towards the sounds of the shout. He enters the dark alleyway holds out his hand, ready to attack. And from behind him, we can see a shadow moving closer and closer. We can see the hooded figure right behind Merlin, whisper a spell, and Merlin is knocked out cold. We cut back to Arthur, who is brooding in his chambers, because when is Arthur not doing that in this show? He is sat by the fire, staring deeply into it, finger to his mouth. There is a loud <laughs> knock on the door and someone immediately enters without waiting to hear an answer it is of course Gwen. do you not know how to knock says arthur immediately out of his stupor wow says Gwen. somebody's crumpy do you know where merlin is no says arthur going back to look in the fire Gwen waits for more information and doesn't get any okay he says well uh if you see him could you tell him i'm looking for him Gaius said he was going out, but nobody seems to know where. Fine, says Arthur, turning back to the fire. You okay, buddy? He says. Go away, Gwen, says Arthur. Gwen immediately shuts the door behind him and comes further into the room. Arthur throws up his hands like, for fuck's sake. Is this about Sir Daniel? Says Gwen. How did you... Did Merlin shout at you for accusing his boyfriend of being a murdering sorcerer? Arthur takes a second to process this sentence. Does... Everyone know about Merlin and Sir Daniel. Well, not everyone, says Gwen, but they do ride out into the woods most night in a secret and suspicious way, so it's pretty obvious. Great, great, says Arthur. And uh, for your information, actually, he is a sorcerer. Merlin's a pretty good judge of character, and if he thinks Daniel's all right, I think he's all right. Although he is friends with you, says Gwen, trying to lighten the mood, and Arthur is just really not having it. That will be all, Gwen, he says. Right. Gwen goes back to the door. Do you know what I always find helpful when I've got a deck? Says Gwen. What? Says Arthur. Saying sorry. Thank you for that stunning piece of advice, Gwen. Says Arthur. Whatever would I do without your counsel? Well, he says, Arthur's chambers on the third floor of the West Wing. Just letting you know. How do you know where Arthur's chambers are? Ah, because the uh, beautiful and free-spirited men and women of Torin are right next door, said Gwen. Gwen leaves with a cheeky grin and a pansexual wink. It's now later in the evening and Arthur has seemingly worked up the courage to finally make his way to Arte's chambers. That being said, he's still not going inside. He's pacing left and right just outside. Goes to knock, doesn't go to knock. He's like, mm -hmm. Finally, he does wrap his knuckles against the door and no one responds. He knocks on it again. Again, nobody's home. He, uh, looks around himself just to make sure nobody's there and then he just lets himself in because he's the king and he's allowed to do that if he wants, in his eyes at least. The inside chambers are messy. Uh, messy in the way that 20 people living in the same space can only ever be. They're filled with people's stuff. 
and Arthur sees some potion bottles lined up on the counter next to the mirror. He picks them up and sniffs them suspiciously. It's Daniel's hair product. Arthur realises what it is and takes some. Way too much of some and puts it in his hair as his hair gets spiked up in a rather unluxurious way. Arthur very quickly realises his mistake. He panics and in true Merlin TM fashion, as he attempts to get the stuff out of his hair, knocks a book that was covered in a shawl off the counter and onto the floor. Arthur forgets his hair for a moment as he goes to pick it up. And as he picks it up, it opens in his hands. On the inside, page after page after page, are scribbles in languages we can't understand, drawings and signs and sigils, very much like the book Merlin has on magic. Arthur's eyes widen as he realises what this is. Just before he can truly start to panic, there is the sound of the door opening and Arthur turns quickly to face it. Daniel walks into the room. He sees Arthur, immediately stops. What are you doing? Arthur panics and half drops the book. Um, um, <clears throat> I'm patrolling. Arthur says, uh, is that my hair poultice? Daniel says. He finally takes notice of the book in Arthur's hands and all of his attention is drawn away from Arthur stealing his stuff to that. He starts to walk over and snatches the book out of Arthur's hands. Where did you get this? He says. In your chambers, Arthur says. If you haven't noticed, this is all our chambers right now, says Daniel. Arthur flustered points over to the counter. Daniel looks at him hard before turning his attention to the book. He brings it over to the table in the centre of the room and as he does it, lights a few candles on that table using magic. Arthur starts at the casual use of magic in front of him. Aren't you afraid I'm going to arrest you? Arthur says. <sighs> I told you, Daniel sighs, I didn't kill those people. Magic's still punishable by death, Arthur says. Yes, I know, says Daniel. He looks up to Arthur, looks him in the eye. So are you going to draw a sword and we are not after Pendragon? There's a beat. Arthur looks just a tiny bit ashamed of himself. No, he says. Daniel nods. Good. They both turn back to the book. Each page is covered in more and more diagrams and old languages. Can you read that? Arthur says. Mostly, says Daniel. <sighs> Do I want to know what it says? Says Arthur. Daniel flicks through a few of the pages. Remember when I told you it would take dark magic to make creatures like this? Well, I think I found the instruction guide. Daniel flicks through even more pages and stops on a page that has been bookmarked with a strip of leather. Daniel starts reading the page in more detail and he looks confused. What? Says Arthur. What is it? This is instructions for a growing spell, he says, but why is it marked out? They both look at the page a little longer. Arthur frowns suddenly. Gaius said something that big could only be a leviathan beetle. Unless... What if the beetles weren't born that way? What if they were made that way using this spell? Daniel nods at Arthur's words. What better way to scupper the talks than turning nations against each other? All right, well, how do you do it? How do you make a beetle big? says Arthur. Daniel runs his hand over the page. Well, it's a powerful spell, he says, reading it. You need the beetle, obviously, uh, the marrow hedge, narrow root, upper like powder. He turns over another page and as he continues to read, he freezes suddenly. To sustain the creature's transformation, he quotes, its life force must be fed with that of another. Arthur thinks about what he said and his face is the look of magic. Fucking great. <laughs> How much life force would you need to change a normal beetle into a leviathan beetle, he says. An enormous amount, says Daniel. About a person's worth, asks Arthur. That would do it, says Daniel, and then realises what he's just said. The missing servants. Arthur has another realisation. Merlin. Both of them turn to each other, horrified. I love the scene now. Arthur and Daniel are now pacing their way down a corridor, obviously searching for something. Arthur is fully kitted out in his armour and Daniel is likewise ready. The book said, says Daniel, that the spell needs to be conducted at the hour the moon is highest. Midnight, says Arthur. We still have time. But where? You need somewhere private, says Daniel, continuing to walk. Somewhere where the beetles in their natural state would be nearby. Arthur ponders. 
I think I know a place, he says. They've reached a set of stairs which seems to go down, down, down into the depths of Camelot, just like the passageway that Merlin took when finding the dragon. Arthur grabs one of the lit braziers on the side of the wall and starts to go down. Daniel starts to follow him. Arthur turns back. What are you doing? He says to Daniel. I'm coming with you, says Daniel. Thanks, but I really don't need your help, says Arthur. I'm not helping you, says Daniel. I'm saving Merlin. Arthur fully turns to him. How do you think you're going to find your way down there? Or how do you think you're going to fight a whole host of flesh-eating beetles by yourself, says Daniel. Arthur shakes his head. You get yourself into trouble down there. I'm not saving you, says Arthur. Wouldn't dream of it, says Daniel, and makes his way ahead of Arthur down the corridor. I'm having the torch, says Arthur. Fine, says Daniel, and lights a flame in his hand. Arthur stares at it and at him, and Daniel walks on ahead. You coming? He calls out. They're properly underground now. The walls are made of cold stone and the ground is just cold, packed dirt. Arthur is in front, the torchlight flickering in front of his face. There's corridors branching off in every direction. Arthur was right, it really is a labyrinth down here. Daniel seems to be fed up with the uneasy silence the two of them have got themselves into. So why don't you like magic? Says Daniel. Shh, says Arthur. No other kingdom is bandit, says Daniel. Do you personally not like magic or are you just doing what your father says? I don't have to explain myself to you, you know, says Arthur. Well, seeing as you threatened to kill me two hours ago, I think you do actually, says Daniel. Arthur looks fed up with this argument already. Magic is evil, he repeats. Mm, surely some people are evil and magic makes that problem worse, says Daniel. Arthur finally stops and turns back towards Daniel. Magic is the thing that killed my mother, he says. Without it, she wouldn't have died. I'm sorry, says Daniel. I don't want apologies, says Arthur. But what if, Daniel says, as they continue to walk, what if someone you liked had magic, but they weren't evil? Well, I don't know anyone who has got magic apart from you, says Arthur, and you're not exactly my favourite person. What would you do if, I don't know, Merlin had magic, says Daniel. Arthur stops again and turns around to look at him in shock. Why would you ask me that? Would you still be running to save him? asks Daniel. Arthur looks flustered, but finally answers, Of course I would. He's my, he's my friend. Huh, says Daniel. What, says Arthur. This is something I've noticed. Merlin seems to have the uncanny ability to inspire loyalty in everyone he meets. Of course he does, says Arthur. He's a good person. He continues on. Daniel chuckles to himself. Yeah, that he is. They hear a sound suddenly. The scuttling of lots and lots of feet. Hurry, we're close, says Arthur, and they start to run down the corridor. They enter a small antechamber. It's bigger than the small stone corridors that they've been going down, but it's still dark and damp in here. Some torches have been lit, and in the dim firelight, we can see inlays on the edges of the circular room. There are stone coffins inside them. The two of them have a moment to take this in before the beetles finally catch up with them. It forces them further into the antechamber as six or seven of them push in from where Arthur and Daniel have just come, forcing them more into the centre of the room. The beetles wait for something or someone clacking their mandibles. One of them, seemingly the ringleader, launches itself at Arthur. Arthur shouts and swings his sword back, cutting its leg. It's driven back, and just as it is, another beetle launches itself at Daniel. Daniel uses a spell to push it back, but there is too many of them coming at him. Watch out, says Arthur, and Arthur takes the opportunity to once again cut at the beetle in the air, saving Daniel. In the brief second of respite, as the beetles warily gather themselves again, Arthur half turns to Daniel. Not bad for a sorcerer, he says. Not bad for a king, says Daniel. Arthur beckons to Daniel, come this way. He leads him into the main chamber, a much bigger room than the antechamber, again circular, with a light appearing from some portcullis far, far above, shining a strip of moonlight down into the centre of the room, where a altar is. On this altar is the unmistakable body of an unconscious Merlin, and more importantly, the hooded figure of a person standing in front of him, looking down at him chanting something. The two of them take this in and momentarily forget the beetles behind them. Get your hands off my manservant, says Arthur. The figure looks up at the sound of Arthur's voice and we can now see his face better, particularly Daniel, who takes a step forward in shock. Duncan, he says. The figure brings their hands towards the hood and lifts it away from their face and it is in fact King Duncan. Turn back, my boy, he says. What are you doing, says Daniel, taking another step closer. Step away from Merlin, says Arthur. The beetles are now blocking their exit route. 
coming into the chamber, but they're not attacking yet. Waiting, it seems, for their master. I don't understand, said Daniel, taking another step and another step towards Duncan. How? Why? You, you don't have magic. No, I do not, says Duncan. He brings up his hand to show Daniel the ring on his finger that he was twirling earlier. The ring has a serpent twirling round it, and now it is growing a sort of sickly green in the half-light. This is borrowed power, he says, and I do not take that lightly. I'm sorry, I did not wish to cause unnecessary harm, but it must be done. Those who die today will number much less than the war that would have come. War, what war, war, says Daniel. You truly believe, says Duncan, that Ranyar and Snurio are not using these talks to their advantage. They have been planning a united front against Artair for so many years now. Ever since Sneri betrayed our trust and became Ranyar's ally, I knew it. They cannot be trusted. The wars between our three kingdoms could have been solved at these talks. Instead, you've made things worse, says Daniel. You wish to ally yourself with the people who killed your father, says Duncan. And prevent others from dying just like him, says Daniel. Of course I do. Duncan, Arthur interrupts. There will be time to talk these slights through and more. A compromise can be met, not like this. If you were older and wiser, Pendragon, Duncan interrupts, you would know that people are only trustworthy when they gain something from your success compromise ha huh. maybe it's time we stop being so old and wise says arthur i hope i'm never wise enough to trust no one we have all hurt one another says arthur casting an eye at daniel but i do believe in a future for everyone everyone he finishes daniel understands what arthur is saying he turns back to duncan whatever that sorcerer has promised you he says cannot trust them. Borrowing another's magic from an anchored item is unstable at best and death at worst. Why did you not speak to me about this? Because I knew your heart is kind, Daniel, says Duncan, and you would not approve of my actions. But the witch promised me her alliance and power in breaking up these talks. Arthur's ears prick. The witch, he says. Who was she? Your sister, says Duncan. Morgana Le Fay. Arthur's lips curl at the name. She's no family of mine. Funny, says Duncan. She said the same thing of you. From far, far above them, the sound of the bells of Camelot can be heard, tolling for midnight. Duncan looks up at the sound and then looks down to the prone body of Mullen in front of him. He takes out a sacrificial knife. Leave, Duncan says, not looking at the both of them. Daniel starts to walk forwards. Daniel, he says, don't make me harm you too. Arthur? Daniel calls out, grab Merlin. Daniel shoots a spell at Duncan. It's not very strong. Duncan only stumbles back away from Merlin and in response, tries to throw another spell back at Daniel. But it's obviously ill-practiced and he's not used to it. It bounces off and ricochets far, far away from Daniel. And in the confusion, the two of them begin to fight, not wanting to hurt each other, but still trying. In this confusion, Arthur runs up to the altar. Merlin is still out cold in the dais. Come on, Merlin, says Arthur, slapping his face. Merlin still doesn't wake up. Arthur looks around him. Next to him, there are some crystals, the things that Daniel read out earlier. There's also a small bowl of liquid that Arthur presumes is water. He takes it and dunks it on Merlin's head. Merlin finally splutters awake. Arthur, he says, what? You dollop head, says Arthur, and gives him a fierce, fierce hug. Meanwhile, Daniel is still fighting with Duncan. Duncan shoots another badly aimed shot at Daniel, and this time it hits the ceiling. There is a rumble, and the bugs start to skitter wildly. Arthur drags Merlin upright, and Merlin winces at his head. Ow! Don't be such a girl, Merlin, come on! says Arthur, but he still bridal style lifts Merlin up and brings him towards the entrance of the antechambers. Daniel and Duncan are still fighting it out and the beetles seem to have started to have gone into panic mode. Duncan aimed another shot at Daniel, but again, he's terrible at it. And instead of hitting Daniel, it hits the ceiling. It rumbles ominously and bits of masonry start to fall. Some of it lands on Duncan and he falls to the floor. Daniel takes this opportunity to watch Arthur and Merlin leaving and follow them. They exit the main chamber, exit the antechamber, where more and more pieces of the ceiling, as kind of crumbling as it was, start to fall. They head further down the corridor before Daniel finally slows down and stops. I have to go back, he says. Arthur, still half carrying Merlin, who's now a lot more awake, turns to look at him as he runs back into the falling rooms. Daniel! says Merlin. Stop, says Arthur. He's it's too late, he's gone. Arthur seems to be stuck at an indecision, looking back and forth between the corridor which he should run down to leave and the opposite corridor which Daniel's just run through. Oh, Arthur's kind of grumbling to himself. Bloody fucking people that you like, Merlin. He puts Merlin down and runs after Daniel. Daniel is inside the main chamber, 
trying to get Duncan off the floor who is severely wounded. Arthur takes one of Duncan's arms and puts it over his shoulder just like Daniel and together they lift him out. They bring him through the chambers which now are collapsing behind them, trapping the beetles inside towards Merlin. Merlin looks up from his position on the floor and sees that a part of the ceiling is about to fall, trapping them inside. He gently whispers a spell and keeps it in place as the three of them finally make their way across the threshold before he lets it go and it collapses behind them. The four of them leave together. They come out into a new corridor, breathing heavily. Arthur is still half carrying Merlin and Daniel is still half carrying Duncan. Duncan cries out in pain suddenly and starts to fall. Duncan, Daniel says, what's wrong? The ring, Duncan says and the ring on his finger, the one that Morgana gave him, has started to tremble, but it visibly tightens. He cries out in pain. Your body cannot cope with magic that is not your own, Duncan, says Daniel, especially not when you're injured. Arthur gathers them all up. Get him upstairs, he says, and they continue to rush along the corridor. It's a brand new day. Duncan is lying in one of Camelot's luxurious beds. He does not look in a good way. He's pale and sweaty and looks like he's on his last legs. Daniel is next to him as always, patting his hand and swiping his forehead with a cool cloth. Arthur is at the foot of the bed, thinking deeply. There's a sound of someone entering and Merlin walks in with Ranyar and Sneary. Found them, he says. Good work, Merlin, says Arthur. Sneary looks at the scene in front of her. What is the meaning of this, she says. The king and the queen look at each other and approach Duncan's side. Duncan coughs up some blood and Daniel wipes it away with the cloth. Our people many years ago were allies, says Duncan. Friends, I know that has not been true for a long time. It was I who made the creatures, says Duncan. Ranyar and Sneary look to each other and him, turned them against you and in turn the two of you against each other. Why? says Ranyar. Because I believed once these talks were over and the alliance between the two of you had been solidified, you would turn against me. Duncan coughs again and there's even more blood on the sheets now. Sneary comes closer and kneels next to the bed. She takes Duncan's hand. Has Karad not been Altair's ally for so many years? she says. Duncan continues to cough and Ranyar comes closer too. I know my father was cruel, he says, but I do not wish to follow in his cruelty. No matter what you may think of me. Arthur is watching this closely. There is still time to rectify these bonds, he says. The talks are not over yet, if you do not wish them to be. They all look at each other, assessing the situation. Some time has passed, and Merlin is looking out by the stairs, out into Camelot's open courtyard. Everyone is packing up now. Entourages have started to leave. Arthur is again shaking hands with people, telling them goodbye, thank you for coming. It looks like the talks have gone well, and people are genuinely and earnestly saying goodbye to each other. Merlin is still looking out over the scene when someone taps him on the shoulder and stands next to him. It makes him jump, and it's just Daniel. Merlin, says Daniel. Hey, Daniel, says Merlin. I'm, I'm so sorry about King Duncan. Leave it, says Daniel. He killed all those people, says Daniel. Yes, says Merlin. He still loved him, though. Well, at the very least, we can bring his body back to our lands and lay him at peace at the top of our mountains, he says, looking out into the distance. It sounds beautiful, says Merlin. It is, says Daniel. I meant what I said, you know. You could come with me. Maybe one day, says Merlin. Maybe, says Daniel. He looks over to Arthur at the foot of the stairs, shaking hands with everyone. I can, uh, I can see why you want to stay now, though. Merlin looks back and forth between the two of them. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> It's not like that, he says. He's a good man, says Daniel, interrupting Merlin. He's a good king. Or maybe even be a nice person one day. He is a nice person, says Merlin, underneath the layer of idiot. Daniel is giving him a raised eyebrow. I'm gonna stop talking now, says Merlin. <laughs> Daniel laughs. He takes Merlin's hand, intertwines their fingers for a second before bringing his hand to his mouth and kissing the back of it like you would do to royalty. He smiles at Merlin and walks down the steps towards the courtyard. See you around, Merlin, he says. Merlin watches him pass Arthur, give him a nod, and mount on his horse. Merlin follows his steps down towards Arthur, and together they both watch him leave with the last of the kingdoms. When the last swish of a horse's tail has gone, the two of them are alone in the courtyard. Well done, says Merlin. Hmm? says Arthur, Merlin seemingly interrupting his thoughts. Well, you managed to orchestrate something no one else has done before. An alliance between all of the kingdoms. Phew, it's pretty powerful. Well, says Arthur, I could only have done it with the help of my manservant and friend. You sound like a cool person, says Merlin. Let me know if, um, if, I, if they're ever around. I'd love to meet them. Merlin 
begins Arthur. He turns to him properly. I know I've been unfair before to magical people and I never meant for that to come between you and Daniel. If you wish to go with them, you can. I won't stop you. You're not getting rid of me that easy, Arthur, says Merlin. Arthur <sighs> takes a deep breath. I'm trying to apologize. Merlin laughs at Arthur and Arthur looks grumpy but relieved that Merlin's laughing. Thank you, says Merlin. That actually means more to me than you know. Don't mention it, says Arthur, turning back to the front. I did want to go with him, says Merlin, staring out to the last place he saw Daniel. But my home is here. My destiny is here, he says, knocking Arthur. Can't leave that. Arthur nods. And he put a lot of product in his hair, Merlin, says Arthur. By that, do you mean he looked after his hair, says Merlin. I didn't like it, says Arthur. Honestly, Merlin, you have terrible taste in men. Merlin thinks about this for a second. What, do you mean vain knights with ostentatious ideologies and a pathological desire to be the hero in every single situation? I don't know what you're talking about, Arthur. He turns and walks back up the steps. Arthur laughs at what he said before he stops and actually realises and goes through what Merlin's just said. He looks up at Merlin, who's walking up the steps. Merlin turns, almost sensing his look. There is a small smile on his face. Arthur sees this and something must click in his head because there is a look of shock and realisation. And Merlin smiles a little more to see it, but he's still sad. Merlin turns back up the stairs and continues to walk up. Come on, he says. You have meetings and a training session this afternoon that Leon will shout at you if you miss. Arthur takes a moment to himself. He looks back to where the last sight of Daniel disappeared and then up to Merlin again, walking up the stairs and follows Merlin. The end. That was how Merlin should have come out. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you have managed to get this far, thank you. I appreciate you. Um, if you would like to donate to my Kofi for, or for poor not paid writers who aren't going to make any money from this because of copyrighted music. I would greatly appreciate it, but you don't have to at all. Please like and comment for this most ridiculous, useless piece of work that I've ever created. Thank you for watching this, um, and I will see you guys soon for another video. I'll see you guys later. Bye!